Hi everyone, we are excited to bring to you our first video, uh, Tale Teller Spotlight. Um, and today we are very, very lucky to be joined by Aaron Griffin, who, uh, Dr. Aaron Griffin, who just recently uh, has a book coming out uh, called Challenges to Integrating Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Programs in Organizations. So um, to start us off, uh, Aaron, thanks for joining us. Um, thanks for having me. It's great to have you. Could you tell us a little bit about your background in K-12 education? Absolutely. Um, my background started in 1999 as a seventh grade English teacher at Grantham Academy in Alden ISD, which is located in Houston, Texas. Um, I was a seventh grade English teacher. I was, an, I was an eighth grade teacher once, but I was a seventh grade English teacher back in that time. No Child Left Behind came out and they moved the star, the writing assessment from eighth grade to seventh grade for my principal talked me into remaining a seventh grade writing teacher. She felt like I was pretty strong at that. Um, after seven years as an English teacher, I became an assistant principal in the same school. So I was blessed to be in the same school for a total of uh, 15 years. So I was a seventh grade English teacher, then became the middle school assistant principal in the same school for eight years, supervising language arts, which was English and writing, and also special education, math, and also uh, ESL. And I was a football coach when I was an English teacher, football, basketball, and I coached track one year. Loved coaching girls basketball. Just loved it. Won two different championships. A wonderful time there. After 15 years in uh, May of 2014, I got a, a LinkedIn message asking if I'd be interested in applying to be a, a high school uh, principal in Colorado Springs. Very, uh, <laughs> that was a, a very, very, very difficult decision to make leaving Texas, which had been my home since I was five years old, being raised in Corpus Christi, Texas. Uh, my wife and I talked about it for about five minutes. She said, jump, go ahead and see it. Take the risk. I took the risk, applied. They invited me out. I was interviewed twice. Long interview process with that as well. Got the job, became a high school principal in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Four years at Sierra High School, love those stallions. Once a stallion, always a stallion. After four wonderful years there, working with that phenomenal staff and community, I cried. When I announced I was leaving, I cried uh, in front of the juniors and seniors. I couldn't help it because we, we went through so much together uh, in those four years, some ups and downs, but definitely more ups than there were downs. Um, one day I was on LinkedIn. My wife said she, well, before I got on LinkedIn, my wife uh, said she wanted to move. She wanted to move to a larger city, uh, not too big like Houston, but a larger city like Denver. Uh, we really were, were thinking about moving back to Texas, but mm -hmm. we wanted to see what the opportunities were in Denver. And I got on, I got back on LinkedIn and um, filled out some filters for diversity, equity, and inclusion. My wife said, you need to be one of those equity people. I said, well, babe, those jobs don't exist very often. A lot of people really don't want to engage in that. And DSST actually posted director of diversity, equity, and inclusion would, would be the founding a uh, person who would open up a new department for DSST in that area. I applied after three months of long interviews with community members, staff, uh, <laughs> district leaders, community leaders, uh, community leaders who are actually professors. Also, one of my interviews was with the National Equity Project, Stephen Chang, because he was one of the consultants working with DSST for formulating this role. Interviewed with all of them, got the offer, accepted the role. My family and I, and I moved for the second time in our life. We moved from Texas to Colorado Springs, and then we moved from Colorado Springs to the greater Denver area, living here in Aurora, working in Denver, and we've decided that we're more than likely going to retire here in, in Colorado. We love the weather here. We love the Denver and Aurora area. We love the work that we get to do. My wife is an instructional coach currently, um, working on her doctorate. She'll be finishing her doctorate at Creighton University uh, more than likely this spring, so Great. Great things happening, and then after that, as you know, we jumped into um, in 2018. I got an offer to do some uh, consulting work around some of the work I did in Colorado Springs with my former superintendent, who was the, my former boss, who was the superintendent in, in Illinois. And I did a five-month series with her around cultural competency, and she looked at me and said, "You need to do this part time," and I did. So we started our own consulting company, Prosperity Educators, where for the last two years. We've been uh, coaching people around diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, systems thinking, organizational planning, professional learning communities, and those things. Wow, and there's fertile ground for that kind of work all over the yeah. K-12 landscape. So that's sure. wonderful that you're doing it. Um, so let's talk about your your book that's coming out. 
uh, challenges yep. to integrating diversity, equity, and inclusion um, programs and organizations. Um, in the book, you look at these very all of these critical issues from a number of different angles, if you will, from um, expanding equity and access in charter schools to culturally responsive social emotional learning, which I'm personally really excited to read that chapter because I've done a bunch of work on SEL as well. Um, can you tell us about your approach to uh, creating and organizing this book and sort of what your vision is for um, what you're hoping to do with it? So this book, the approach from this book came from my perspective as a practitioner. So mm -hmm. about, when was it, what was it? It was in Philadelphia in 2014. I went to my first American Educational Research Association conference. And it was at that conference, I met Dr. Geneva Gay for the first time. Um, oh, the author of social responsiveness. Um, and I was in a, in a room with, I was in a group with, with her and she was talking about the, the gap between theory and practice. Mm -hmm. and, and she mentioned that here we are again talking about theory and practice. How do we get theory into practice? How do we have practitioners and higher ed bridge that gap. I never forget that conversation because I was I was finishing up my doctorate and I was an assistant principal and that that touched my core and I said yes because what I'm doing in my school is exactly that. I'm doing the practice from the theory. And so that set me on a pay on a pace, I mean on a path and I thought about it. I said when I become a principal, if I ever get to be a principal, this is what I'm gonna do. And when I became a principal, I remember distinctively our staff came together our leadership team and they said hey dr g we really need you to start to use your research um on our campus and help us understand cultural competency cultural relevancy cultural responsiveness uh how to respond to microaggressions so we set up a we set up a a, a five-month series mm -hmm. where i started the series and i started with identity biases and microaggressions. Then we moved in the, in the cultural responsiveness. Then we moved in uh, from, from Goddard, we moved in trust. We moved in the efficacy. We moved in collective efficacy. We moved through all these things. And then what happened is staff members actually started partnering on their own development series off of that. So mm -hmm. what I saw was practitioners respond, in my opinion, from my experience, practitioners respond better when there are strategies and practices that come out of the theory versus standing up and saying this is the theory and this is what this means and this is what you should be doing it needs to be done from a way of this is what we do this is how we incorporate this so we had a lot of practices in that and then we were blessed with an opportunity to have restorative justice brought into our school after an event that occurred and we made that culturally responsive as well we didn't follow restorative justice by the letter of the law the way they outlined it we made it fit our school and our kids, and our kids told us how they felt we should do restorative justice. So fast forwarding to now, one day I was sitting back, my first year in DSST, I just started, it was in the fall of 2018, and I got an email from IGI Global saying, hey, you know, Dr. Griffin, we're looking for a book proposal. Do you have something that might have been swirling? And it just so happened that in my, I have a journal for scholarship. I got down, and it just so happened I had written down um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, like, what was it? Narratives on diversity, equity, and inclusion from mm -hmm. a practitioner perspective. So I said, forget it. I'm just going to type this up. And I typed it up, and they accepted it. And they said, hey, this sounds very promising. We want to call it challenges to diversity, equity, and to integrating diversity, equity, and inclusion programs and organizations. Because I wasn't just talking about P12. I was mm -hmm. talking about all organizations like the problem we have and my it's not a problem but when i read the research on diversity equity, and inclusion is usually done outside of practice it's done on like we do case studies on me but what if a practitioner wrote it from our perspective oh, that's so one of the things i like to focus on is practitioner scholarship because i consider myself a practitioner scholar i'm in practice but i still do scholarship i present i publish i write so I sent out the I sent out the uh, the call, and I and specifically in the call I sent it to either former or current DEI officers who are willing to tell their story through research. So a lot of the people in the book are P12 practitioners. Some of them are either current or former officers. Some of them are in higher ed, but they used to be in P12. Um, I have a, a, a special education 
um, um, a manager who's now transitioned to Rhode Island. Um, so this, one, this individual is doing practitioner scholarship. So out of the 14 chapters, I would say the majority of those chapters are people who are still in practice, like NP12 or are former practitioners. So this, the chapters are told from the perspective of this is what it's like to do this work versus this is the theory. So yes, there are theory, theory in there, critical race theories in there, social emotional learning is in there, but they're talking about it from a practitioner perspective. And what I love is each one of these chapters has almost a call to action. Like this is what you need to do. This is how we do it versus this is what it is. That's so huge. And I know, so my dissertation, and I've done a lot of research in this area and continue to do it, is in culturally responsive pedagogy. And I could tell you firsthand that that's what my dissertation was on, the gap. So this, you're filling a huge need, the gap between the theory and the practice. There's an enormous gap. And as you could probably attest to do in professional developments, and it, you kind of alluded to it, teachers want something tangible they can take and do right now. And, and, and when they're going to professional development. So I think what you're offering them is that, uh, and, and not just teachers, but, but across the organization, different yeah. stakeholders, yeah. Um, which is a huge gift to the work of those doing diversity, equity, and inclusion work. So and let me yeah. add something to what you just said. When I said the majority of these folks are in practice, I don't mean just educational practice. Right. There are, there are chapters by people who are not in education that are in other industries and they put this in. So that's what I want, that's what this is about. This is not just education. These are people that, are, that have done research outside of education and they're talking about the practices. Like um, I have a couple, I would have had more from overseas but COVID-19 hit and I lost three, three uh, authors who were actually impacted by COVID in themselves or the whole research thing. And these were people who were doing studies on industry. Like I have a couple of chapters that are on industry, like one from Turkey in particular is on industry and the impact of women in that, in a, in a, um, I believe a communications industry. Uh, so this is not just education. This is like multi industry. So anyone can look at e any of these chapters and apply it to their organization. And that's what's great though, because the DEI work like transcends what kind of industry you're in, right? I mean, it's, I mean, that's a, that, that's a, a transcendent issue we're all dealing with. We're trying to work through and get better at. So I think that's, yeah. having those multiple perspectives is so valuable. So you've done a ton of work in uh, organizational diversity and inclusion you, that you've even shared with us. Um, can you talk about, like, let's get down to the, the ground a little bit more. Um, what's your approach to working with an organization that's looking to become more diverse, equitable, and inclusive? Like, where, where do you even start? Uh, well, I start where the organization is mm. versus starting where the organization is not. One of the, and I, like, I, like I said, I, I'm, I'm taking it from the experiences of when I was an English teacher, when I was an assistant principal, when I was a principal. So as an English teacher, I learned very quickly, I have to start where my students are versus where, where I want them to be. I, I start where they are and I build scaffolds in to build them up. I was an English teacher who always had, back in that time, it was called content mastery. And then it shifted from content mastery. Content mastery was when students would go into a small, go to another classroom for content mastery. So those students would get their modifications or adjustments and we would send them out. Well, once 2001 came in, we went away from content mastery because they wanted to be more inclusive because that came across as discriminatory. So once we moved into that, that element of away from content mastery and more mainstreaming was what it was called back then, but we know it as inclusion now. And what happened is I always had emotionally disturbed students in my class. I always had students who may have had uh, behavioral issues in their class. I always had students who had IEPs and I even had students who were dual served who had IEPs and were second language learners in addition to have second language learners. So I always learned, start where kids are, give them, work with them where they are and teach them over time. When I was an assistant principal coaching teachers, start where the teacher is, build scaffolds. When I was a principal, we would hire people. And in the interview process, we would determine very, because we use the interview process as also an evaluative process. So we would interview people, have a conversation. It was never me, just me. It was an assistant principal over that department, plus the department chair or, or, or teachers. And we would have a conversation and they would tell me, this is what the strengths are. These are the weaknesses. We recommend we hire this person, but we start to develop them immediately. 
And I would talk to some individuals and say, hey, the team loved you. We get them in and we say, hey, here are some areas that we want to immediately address. You see what I'm saying? We didn't wait until they started failing. We would go ahead and address classroom management right now or send them to PD because there's a, a gap in their instructional pedagogy. So I do the same thing now. I go into an organization, we have a conversation, and the organization tells me, this is what we've done or haven't done. This is what we wish we could have done. This is where we want to be. Here's our data. Because sometimes it's looking at data, sometimes it's looking at staff surveys, sometimes it's looking at demographics, sometimes it's looking at where an organization wants to be, and we start right there. The organization tells me, this is where we want to go, this is where we are, and we have a dialogue of a series and sequence to get them where they want to be. And in many cases, I have to push back. Like they'll say, well, we want to focus on anti-racism. And I ask them why. Why anti-racism? Well, you know, that I'm like, no, that sounds like a fact. Like we can't make anti-racism or cultural responsive and cultural relevance a fact. I remember two years ago, somebody kept telling me um, in my own network, hey, Dr. G, when are you going to do cultural relevance? I said, as soon as people understand who they are and their identity, and they go, what do you mean? You can't do cultural relevance and cultural responsive work until people have unpacked, and not just white people, people have unpacked who they are and their identity from a racial perspective, an ethnicity perspective, a sexuality perspective, a gender perspective, and how we've been socially enculturated in, in the narrative of the United States. Some people have never unpacked how I show up as an individual in this space and understanding our biases and our microaggressions before we start to say, we're gonna be culturally responsive and relevant. Well, you can't do that if you don't actually know who your kids are and who you are. So that's where I start with organizations. We start with, what have you done? Let's build on that. And then also we go into, my wife and I go into, let's look at the work we do as a part of what your organization is already doing. This mm -hmm. cannot be separate. This has to be incorporated. And that's the way we do it in DSST. That's literally what I do as a consultant and as an author is what I do in DSST. There's no separation for me. This is 24 seven. Wow. You know, and I really appreciate two things. Well, I appreciate all that you said, but two things that really jumped out to me. One is that identity, self-identity piece is where you start. It's, it's, you, it's impossible to get into anything when it comes to DE&I until we start to deconstruct who we are, which takes a lot of, it's hard for people. I mean, I know you can attest like to really look in the mirror and say, yeah. who am I? Uh, what do I believe? What are my biases? That's not easy work. Um, and I think the other piece, and the other piece I really appreciate is when you think about culture and identity, looking at all these different markers, right? Um, and it, like you said, you know, a lot of times, you know, p people don't, they stop at race or ethnicity and that they think that's culture. And there's so much more to what formulates our lenses. So I really appreciate you taking that more holistic approach. It does kind of lead in nicely to the next question. Um, we live in an interesting time period when it mm -hmm. comes to the issues around diversity and equity and inclusion. Uh, very challenging on many fronts uh, that we had, may not have even experienced a few years back. Now, with that has become people who have become, uh, who are resistant. So what do you say to those that are resistant to equity and inclusion work when you're working with them or if you're not working with them? Um, how, do you, how do you really move the needle um, and get them to see that it's so important for them or the organization in which they're working and really the world at large to do this kind of work? Right. So again, like you said, it goes back to what I said in the previous question. So it goes back to starting where those individuals are, mm -hmm. unpacking why are they resistant to this? What is, what is the problem? And every single individual has a different reasoning why they are resistant. Some are resistant because they don't want to hear about white privilege. Some are resistant because they don't want to hear about patriarchal privilege and power. Some are resistant because I shouldn't have to do this work as a black person or a Latinx person or an LGBTQIA identifying person. I shouldn't have to do this work. I already know this work. They need to do this work. Um, some people are resistant because they feel like men need to own their own growth and understand how men show up in their power privilege. And notice I said men, I didn't say white men, I didn't say black men, I said men, because this work has to be intersectional. The problem I've run into when people are resistant is that the work is not intersectional enough and does not value that person's perspective as to why they are resistant. 
We cannot cancel that person's background experiences and perspective. Let me give you a, a prime example. Um, I had a, a conversation, it was two years ago, it was at the end of my first year, and there was a, a, a young lady who was in sixth grade, uh, Caucasian identifying, who did not want to read, uh, was it um, The House on Mango Street? Oh. Because The House on Mango Street talks about, you know, uh, Latin American, Latinx, Hispanic family. Um, I haven't read it, but my son's in there, so I, I know about it. Um, and she was very resistant to the idea that the, in the United States, or white people in particular, have harmed Latin American family. And she cited her, was so powerful about this 11-year-old, and she said, because, for example, and she gave her examples. So I talked to the teacher, and I said, well, you know, number one, value her perspective, because that's real for her. And she's like, well, how is that real? I said, because she's in a house where they have these conversations. So that's her reality. Do not negate that young lady's reality, whether you agree or disagree. It's not about that she's wrong, because she is right according to her reality. So you have to educate and offer. And that's what the teacher did. The teacher sat down and said, wow, that's a great perspective. Let's talk about some other perspectives. And she, she came back and she said, the, the young lady was like, wow, I didn't realize that. See, a lot of times people don't know an alternative perspective and you have to offer that to them, not give it to them. Hey, can I share this with you? So that's how I usually approach this work because trust me, every session I go into here in DSST, in my consulting work, there's always at least one person who is not happy and are pushing back and they will ask some very candid questions and I have to help them understand, like I'm not here to call you a racist, I'm not here to call you a sexist, I'm not here to call you a feminist, I'm not here to call you homophobic, I'm not here for that. I'm here to help you recognize your space and your agency to do the work, to show up in your power and privilege and, you, and be an ally, but also receive allyship because some of us don't want allyship. Some of us want to do the work by ourselves and you don't get to tell me about this work. No. So I approach this very, very um, differentiation, very, very diverse based on that person's experiences and offer them the space to live in their agency, live in their reality and space for them to own their personal growth and development. We cannot dismantle beliefs and the ideology. We can only disrupt it and make it uncomfortable. That is it. I think that's so powerful what you just said. And I think you're, you've got more of a challenge than you might've had pre-social media, right? We've got, cause yeah. that's not how uh, discourse has gone of late. Uh, no. you know, I'm right, you're wrong, and let me tell you why. Here are the facts, or here are some emotional appeal, right? Not just, let me offer you something here, and let me let you mull it over. I think that's such a hugely important orientation. I hope that all the listeners pick up on that, is, is that, that, you, that creates fertile ground for transformation. And I just love the way that you do that. That's so brilliant. Yeah, I um, love what you said. That's, trans that's the goal. The goal is transformation. Yeah. The goal is not change. Because change can be changed back. The goal is transformation. Transform people's mindsets. Transform people's reality. Transform why I do the work. I may not agree, but I know this, this feels right, or this looks right, or this sounds right. So I'll go ahead and engage. Even though I disagree, I'll engage because you've given me the space to do that, knowing that we disagree, but we still value each other's perspective. I mean, look, I'm a black male. And yes, when I show up as a black male who's about 280 pounds into a session, trust and believe, I know because of cultural competency, I know someone's intimidated. Right. PhD, I know someone's intimidated. Yep. I know this. So because, of, because I know how they view me and, and, and perspective that um, how they view me and how I view myself and how I view them, I have to consciously think about that and create the space for pushback. I'm not the expert in the room. I'm an ex I have an expert. I have an expertise, but everybody in here is an, ex is an expert in you. So maybe you can teach me something I didn't know coming into this space. And what a great tangible example of why you got to do the identity, self-identity work first. You just, you just painted the picture for everybody. That's huge. Yep. So kind of circling just one more time, a little bit around the modern, the current modern context. Um, 
we have a lot going on right now, um, particularly specific to broken race, race relations from, you know, things going on around the Black Lives Matter movement and what gave rise to that, uh, a tremendous rise in white supremacy, um, you know, to uh, continued social, political, and economic inequalities that are being, a light is being shown on them like never before. Not that they're new, but now they're sort of kind of into the mainstream now. Um, how does all of that affect your work that you're doing around diversity, equity, and inclusion? So um, I want to say I want to answer that in two ways. One, I constantly get the question as to, hey, Aaron or Dr. Griffin or Dr. G, how did COVID-19, you know, point out systemic inequities? And then what did uh, George Floyd's killing add to this? Mm -hmm. And I love to tell people that that line of, of, of questioning and thinking is problematic for me mm. because people assume that none of this existed. Right. No, everything was there. So this rise, this rise, in my estimation, it isn't a rise. Mm -hmm. It was already there. It's just that we're in an age of social media and the more awakening people get, the more awareness people get, the more they can name it. See, in the past, people couldn't name it. Now that they have exemplars and examples everywhere, now people can say, that's white supremacist, that's misogynist, that's homophobic. So it's almost like it's not that there's a rise in it, people are able to name it now because this has been going on forever. Absolutely. Like, listen to all the people who are now going back and filing past lawsuits yeah. because they didn't know what it was. Now they know what it was. So now they're saying, I was sexually harassed. I suffered from abuse. I suffered from racism. I suffered from homophobia. Homophobia. I suffered from um, a misogynist boss. People now have vocabulary to name what it is. So when we say that these things are rising, then people assume that they're gonna die down. No, they exist. Let's just accept that this is our reality. This is our this is what it is, and we're naming it. So now we have to address what we've now named, which takes me to point number two. How this is impacting my work is that I am making sure that I have to be centered and I have to be grounded in what I'm doing. Meaning I have to make sure that my wife and I and our consultancy are not falling into fads. Then my wife does equity work in her network as well as an instructional coach. She has to make sure that her, she as an equity leader on her campus is not allowing her campus to go into fads. And then I have to make sure that in my network, I'm not allowing us to go into fads. And then my little boys who are black males, when they come home and have conversations, I have to make sure they're not going into fads. Let me explain. Mm. Right now, what is the hot buzz topic? Anti-racism. Right. Last year, it was close to responsive teaching in the brain, Zaretta Hammonds. Oh, right. The year before that, it was implicit and unconscious bias along with cultural responsiveness. Every time we look for a solution to a problem, that's a long-term historical problem, we grasp why fragility was becoming popular last year. And as soon as everything, all the protests started, it was Robin DiAngelo. And then suddenly it was um, uh, Ibram Kendi. Now I'm starting to see more work around abolitionist teaching. I can't remember the author's name right now, but now we're moving to that. So all of these are great works. All of these are great strategies, but don't grab onto one. So in my work, I am making sure that any organization I work, work with does not grab onto one. Yeah. All of these are tools you use to become socially justice oriented. In DSST, we are not going to sit here and say that this is the only resource we have. If you want to do anti-racist work, great. But at the same time, do you know why you're doing that? And this is what I ask any organization. Number two, what else have you done to prepare your staff for this? Again, the identity work. Yeah. When, I, when we meet with organizations, I did some work in Hawaii recently. They didn't want to do anti-racist work. They wanted to focus on cultural responsive and relevance because they'd already done some identity work in Hawaii around that community. So we did like a brief historical recollection of racism and systemic inequity in education, starting from the literacy laws of South Carolina, 
and how that impact, how that has impacted systemic education in the United States context. And then we got into cultural responsive irrelevance. You see what I'm saying? So yeah. I started with where they were. There's an organization I'm working with right now who wanted me to go all the way back to the history of education, then identity, then bias, then cultural responsiveness. Wow. So the way my work has shifted is one, making sure we're not falling into fads and calling that the checkbox, no checkboxes. Number two, making sure organizations know who they are, where they are, and where they want to be. Number three, making sure there's ways to hold people accountable. Like what happens when I leave? Right. What's the follow-up to this work? And number four, making sure people have agency to do their own personal development. See, right now we have a lot of people doing professional development, but what's the personal development plan? How are you holding your people that you work with accountable for their own development? Because it's not enough to say, um, let's say if I work for, well, I'm not going to throw out any names. I don't want you sued or me sued. Let's say I work for a big Fortune 500 company. And the company says, we're going to do this work. Okay, great. But as an employee, I should be held accountable for my personal work, not yes. just the professional work. Because this is twofold. This is professional and personal. People like to separate. Remember, you asked me that question about how do I deal with people who don't want to engage? Mm -hmm. They don't want to do the personal work. Yeah. They just want to do the per professional work. So we right. got to create space. So my work right now is literally pushing people to get out of the fad, focus on you, and focus on the professional development with an outcome. Well, if you don't do the personal work, right, it's either totally inauthentic or it doesn't show up at all in, in the professional mm -hmm. space, right? I mean, this is Absolutely. who we are is how we show up in whatever vocation we do. So that's huge. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, I mean let, I'll use myself as an example again. I am a black, African-American, cisgender, heterosexual male. I grew up in a community where we did not talk about gay and lesbian and queer and trans. Yes, there were people around us, but we did not talk about that. Yeah. My personal work is learning more about the LGBTQIA community and reaching out to peers who identify as LGBTQIA and checking my blind spots and checking my biases. My manager checked my bias in July. I did something I didn't realize I was doing and they, who's gender fluid, said, hey, FYI, when you asked me to do this, this felt very tokenizing. Mm. I said, OMG, my apologies, you are absolutely correct. Sounds like I need some more work to do to know how to do this work myself with them as a partner, not doing the work for me. See, and I think... I see exactly what you're saying. And I think what you just described is what I hope our listeners take away, parents, teachers, any, anybody who's listening to this, is that it's, it's almost like a fun journey to like learn who am I and then to learn about what I don't know or, you know, this, some maybe a, a, these others, if you will, which is, you know what I mean? It, people get otherness, but, 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 and allow yourself to learn. Like as a teacher, I always said, I'm a student, I'm a student of my student's culture. They taught me more than I ever taught them. And, and that was, it changes who you are. It changes how you perceive things and how you experience the world and process things. And, and at the same time, and I'm really glad you shared this, it's okay to like, you're going to have missteps along the way because you're a learner and that's okay. Hold on for a Okay. <laughs> virtual world, my kids are on fall break right now. They're happy and excited. <laughs> um, I wanted to share, um, Kylie, I hope I don't miss what you said. The last point, you, oh my God, can you say that last point again? Yeah, that, that there are going to be missteps along the way, and that's okay because we're learners and we're learning. That, that's the key, the missteps. Because some of the reason why people don't want to engage is because they are afraid to get it wrong. Yeah. They're afraid to say the wrong thing. There. Why do you think I called my DEI manager and said, hey, can you do a blurb for this? Because I'm afraid to say the wrong thing versus me do the blurb, me do the research, me put it together and say, hey, does this sound right? Did I do this right? Yeah. Where can you coach me? So they started coaching me on how I can do that better. And in the argument, to your point, going back again, I didn't say this. I'm glad you brought it up. How does this transform my work? 
I am pushing people, fail forward. It is okay to fail as long as you fail forward and you fail well. The way you fail wrong is not to even engage and just, and just sit back because your inaction creates problems and ripples and says a whole lot about where you sit versus actually engaging, messing up, saying, I messed up, I'm sorry, how can I do this better? Can you partner with me? Can we do this together? And then we move forward and then we, we check, not check off, we celebrate our small wins. It doesn't matter how small the win. Hey, we had our first session today. Bam, we've never done this before. Bam, after our first session, this is what our post survey said. Bam, oh my God, I noticed this. Small wins until we get to the big win. What we fail to do in DEI work is we don't celebrate the small wins. We're only focusing on when we can fully say we're culturally responsible and relevant, when we're trauma-informed when we're anti-racism. That may take 30 years or ever because in DSST we say, and in my consulting work, DEI is a journey, not a destination. You may never ever arrive at that outcome, but guess, look at all the wins you've had along the way. Like this year in DSST, I have yet to lead a DEI session on any campus. My first two years, I was leading sessions all the time. We're really co-facilitating because I require somebody to facilitate with me. Mm -hmm. Because we've done that, these people who facilitated with me in a trainer of trainer model are now facilitating their own sessions with me and with my DEI partner and myself as thought partners. Wow. We're not having to lead the sessions anymore. We're not even co-planning. We're actually being partners and giving feedback. That's what we're doing. So that's a win that's a small win no we're not culturally responsive no we're not culturally relevant no we're not fully inclusive like we want to be but guess what more people are starting to feel that we're trying and that we're engaged that's the key show stop being performative show people that you're doing the work so that people can give you some grace just a little bit and oh my goodness, you said the magic word gives give you some grace a little bit. That's it's we all need that right now, don't we? And yep. uh, I just love that. So let me ask you. I'm going to go a little little bit of a different direction on this last question. So when you finally get to turn it off at the end of the day or the end of the week, and you and you and you're not thinking about all this incredible work that you're doing, what do you think about? <laughs> <laughs> Sadly, I mean, you're asking this question, and it's so sad. And I say it's sad. It's not sad, but sadly, my boss uh, and my uh, and and her boss, our CEO, which I meet with our CEO twice twice a month. He and yeah. I have weekly check-ins for me to update for him to coach me as well. And then I meet with my boss every single week. And sadly, when they've asked that question, I say, "Well, Saturday is my scholarship and consulting." Mm. Um, so to, when I turn it off, I am literally, I'm watching football, I'm watching basketball, I'm moving night with the kids, but it never really turns off mm. because when I'm not doing work with DSST, that same work transitions to my scholarship, which is yeah. how I was able to, to uh, edit this book and in my own book, The Power of a Praying Principle, plus another edited book that's coming out, Fighting, uh, Fighting the Good Fight, National Narratives of the African American Experience, plus another book I have on P12 practitioners, race mentoring and P12, pre-12 educators, practitioners contributing to research. So that's how I balance because that's, yeah. that, that fills my bucket because my, my, I am purpose driven. And my purpose is to be the DEI 24 seven. I can't even watch a movie without a critical race, coastal responsive, yeah. anti-racist lens. Like I can literally, like literally right now, I haven't done it yet. And I'm just going to throw this out here uh, because I find it very problematic in the current time when we're talking about a vaccine mm -hmm. that I see commercials about HIV medication. And what I noticed very quickly is that the actors or the real life people None of them are cisgender, heterosexual. None of them are heterosexual males. Oh, interesting. When you look at these commercials, you see 
African American people, you see Latinx people. You even see African American straight couple. I assume they are. But then you also see transgender people. You'll see two white males in a partnership. But I never see a white male with a white woman together in any of these commercials. Wow. So think about that from a research perspective. You know, you look at, I don't, the old research was that African American, poor people, drug users more likely to get HIV, okay? In the early 80s, AIDS was attributed to gay white men. Right. So these commercials show me that the perception being orchestrated intensely or unintentionally, doesn't matter. There is a perception being orchestrated that cisgender, heterosexual, white men and women are not the people of our target audience, even though we know that there are people out there who have HIV. Wow. And but it's, if, you look, if you look at the, like next time you see an I HIV will. medication commercial, watch. Every time you see one, watch and see who are the people. So this gives me agency. I've never turned it off. I, I can't, there's, there's no way I try, but I can't because I'm always monitoring what's, what, what's being filtered so I can use that in my development to help people understand how social constructs are developed because that's a social construct that is being developed in people's mind that these people don't get HIV. Only yeah. these people do. So I find that problematic because COVID-19 came out and what, what was the initial research? Elderly people. Right. Black and brown people. Native Americans, even though rich elite people were some of the first early cases. Yep. But no one talked about that. You see what I'm saying? So it's yep. very hard for me to, to turn that off. So that's what I do. When I'm not doing the work, I'm just relaxing and thinking about how I can be better and how I can make other people better. And you know what's cool about that, though, is like you just explain what it's like when you find your purpose. You know, for so many people that... Well, you know, I think that don't go after that purpose or, or just say, ah, that's something on the purpose. When you live on purpose, it looks like what you just described. It, you live it. It's, 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 it doesn't turn off. It's almost who you are and you, you can't. And I just think that's so cool that you shared that. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Griffin, it was an incredibly wonderful time talking to you. Um, Every, uh, everybody, we will have links uh, in the blog post below to all the great work that Dr. Griffith's doing, including uh, the books that he referenced and his consulting work and, and other, other pieces. So please be sure to check that out. Um, and Dr. Griffin, thanks for uh, being our first video, Tale Teller Spotlight. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was awesome. Appreciate you. Awesome.